All right. Thank you, everyone, for joining us for our July webinar, Whoop. looking at goldfish buoyancy disorders. So for those of you who weren't able to join us for our June webinar on carp pox in koi, um, if you have watched some of our other webinars, this one's going to be decidedly shorter. We're trying to focus in on just one topic here today, and all of this information will be available online after the fact. And we also will have some time at the end for questions if anyone has them. For those of you who are not familiar with Zoom, there is a little chat box that you can use to enter your questions, and then I will review them at the end. So today's lecture will cover goldfish anatomy, more specifically to how it deals with buoyancy. Some common causes of buoyancy disorders, both positive and negative buoyancy, and how to help a goldfish if they are dealing with a buoyancy disorder. We'll go through some of the things you should definitely check, and that's even before you get a veterinarian involved. And then we'll end with if anybody has any questions, I will do my best to answer them. So looking at goldfish anatomy, so specific to a goldfish, they usually have at least two chambered swim bladders. So you can see uh, the cranial, and in this one has a larger caudal. Now, this is obviously a long bodied goldfish that has neutral buoyancy. So most pet fish and goldfish in particular should be neutrally buoyant. So this means that they're able to maintain um, their body position in the middle of the water column. Some other species are either going to be positively buoyant and kind of roam around the top purposefully. There's some uh, fish that have little eyes that kind of sit up above the surface, and those guys are actually more positively buoyant. And then negatively buoyant, such as loaches and placostomus, need to sink to the bottom because that's where all their food is in the detritus. So for goldfish, usually they're relying on the two chambers of their swim bladder that you can see really, really well with radiographs or x-rays. So then we have, you can see the spine, um, some air in the intestine, and this guy actually has a little pebble stuck in his mouth, which was the reason behind the radiographs that this guy got, just to check and see if there were any other um, pebbles in there that we needed to be aware of. So, when fish are developing, the swim bladder actually arises from the GI tract. So it starts as an out pocket that may or may not retain its patency. So there are two different groups of fish within you know, all these many thousands of thousands of fish species. You have the physoclistus fish, which actually has the swim bladder pinch off entirely from the GI tract. And they use a gas gland that will secrete air out of the bloodstream into the swim bladder in order to inflate it. Now the physostomus fishes retain this remnant of their GI tract that connects the esophagus to the swim bladder. And this is where goldfish and their koi cousins fall into. So you can see in this picture here, this is a little tiny goldfish. You can see that very clear tube is the pneumatic duct connecting right between the cranial and caudal swim bladder chambers. So the duct actually goes right to the midpoint of the two. It doesn't kind of go in one and then get pushed in the other. It's right in the middle. Both types of fishes have what's known as a reet mirable that is used to take extra air out of the swim bladder. And essentially this works very similar to the gas gland in the reverse. So this will actually take gas from the swim bladder and push it back into the bloodstream through a very, very dense network of capillaries. It's a little bit kind of how our lungs work, but not dealing with specific oxygen. Um, nitrogen, other gases are definitely found in the swim bladder, depending on what species and where they live in the world. So looking a little closer at fancy goldfish anatomy, which makes up a larger proportion of those fish that we see with swim bladder issues. Yes, they're very cute. Yes, they're very adorable looking, but unfortunately they have been bred to have severe structural issues. So you can see with this little ranchu that is pictured in the radiograph here has a severe curvature of his spine and looks like those two swim bladder chambers have kind of been separated and one has actually been pushed all the way down towards his vent. 
So we do see a fair amount of spinal curvatures in these guys, which can impinge upon the salomic chamber when which the swim bladder rests. They also sometimes have long tails, which is gonna pull on the vertebral column. And again, pull and kind of keep that salomic chamber from possibly inflating to its fullest potential. But most problematic is we see decreased swim bladder volume. So a lot of fancy goldfish, they don't have two chambers of their swim bladder. They usually only get one. So when you have this little round ball trying to balance on a ping pong ball, it makes buoyancy disorders a little bit easier to happen. So we have a lot of fish that just don't have a caudal swim bladder. Some get lucky and have another one. Those usually tend to be a little bit more um, robust in their, their buoyancy, but it definitely depends on your fish's anatomy if they're even set up to maybe have normal buoyancy function. We have had cases where normal buoyancy is just not possible for these fish just based on their structural setup. And usually we're gonna need radiographs in order to really get a complete picture of what's going on inside. So even with these radiographs, these are six different fancy goldfish. We have Ryukins, we have Orandas, Moors, Ranchus, and a um, Lionhead Ranchu cross. And these are the radiographs that we have compiled. Now from just the pictures, can you guess which ones are positively buoyant and which ones are actually negatively buoyant? So take a minute and look at those radiographs and just, just think to yourself, you don't have to put it in the notes or anything like that. And just try to think which one of these would be positively buoyant and which one of these would be negatively buoyant. And also just appreciate how different all of these different goldfish look, especially the spines. Some of those spines are a little wonky, but all these fish are able to swim around okay for the most part. All right, so we're going to put a green box around the fish that have positive buoyancy disorders and a red box around those that have negative buoyancy disorders. So Hopefully you got at least a couple right. Some of these are a little bit of a gimme. Obviously this tiny fish with a giant swim bladder in the middle top row, that is obviously a very, very blatant positive buoyancy disorder. However, this big long fantail or Ryukin cross has a lot of air in there, but she is just such a heavy fish that she's actually negatively buoyant. So we actually tried a new technique of a tail trim on her right now to see if we're able to alleviate some of the pressure that's on her spine that you can see is getting pulled down. The fish on the bottom right actually has fluid in the swim bladder. So rather than having a nice round swim bladder, you can see the bottom is slightly compressed. So this is what we call a fluid line. If you're ever around our YouTube channel, we'll show you how we take radiographs with the fish sitting upright. And therefore we pass the beam laterally through their body. So if there is any fluid, we'll be able to catch it on the radiographs. So those are just some of the fun buoyancy cases that we're dealing with intermittently. So what are some of the most common causes of negative buoyancy disorders? The number one cause of negative buoyancy in fish is stress. And that is most often caused by poor water quality. Yes, my favorite topic to talk about. If your water chemistry is terrible, your fish is stressed. And when your fish is stressed, their immune function doesn't work well. All of their buoyancy compensation devices, just all the wiring in their brain just shunts to let's stay alive. So a lot of the times it can just be a fish's reaction to poor water quality that they're having buoyancy issues. They can also be just in a poor environment. So we see this a lot with goldfish that have been in fish bowls for prolonged periods of time. Um, especially if you're not doing water changes fairly regularly, um, all of the growth and stress hormones that we really don't think you can test for on a regular basis, those are gonna build up in the water chemistry and also stress your fish out. And yes, bullying, goldfish can be bullies sometimes. Some are better as only children and some just, you know, just don't play well with others. So certainly that stress can make a fish more prone to being negatively buoyant. 
Lack of nutrition is another big one. This is just a fish that feels miserable and doesn't have enough energy to swim. So they sink to the bottom and just hang out there. So in this case, it's actually a lack of proper nutrition and enough energy to get up and swim. So for those of you who've had buoyancy issues and have fasted your fish, uh, you're actually making the problem worse because a lot of these fish need more energy because they're expending so many more calories to try to swim normally. Again, that genetic factor, some goldfish just don't have enough room to inflate their swim bladder for their body size. And some actually have those spinal disorders as well, which make it very hard to swim. Sometimes it hurts, sometimes it just doesn't work well, so they'll sink to the bottom. And again, present as negative buoyancy when really maybe the internal structure is fine, just their spines just can't keep up with the rest of their bodies. So now we're gonna to flip to positive buoyancy disorders. So we see this a lot in goldfish that are fed at the surface. There's a bunch of them in the tank. They all just chow, chow, chow. Basically like little golden retrievers all eating as much as they can at the surface. And remember these fish are physostomous. So lots of vigorous surface eating. They're gonna swallow a lot of air. And some of that's gonna be a transient in the GI tract, but some of it's gonna end up in the swim bladder. So usually this is a temporary issue that is associated with feeding time. And this is one of the easiest buoyancy disorders to correct. And I'll tell you more about that in a minute. We can also have structural problems with swim bladder function and basically just overinflation. So that reed mirabile that is responsible for taking out extra air Sometimes that doesn't work correctly, um, especially if there is a part of the spine that is pushing down on the back end of the swim bladder, which is where that reek kind of rests. Um, chronic inflammation, just that air is not going to get out. So with that, the swim bladder just keeps overfilling and it doesn't have the signal to unfill it. And again, our little fancy guys, if you take a long body goldfish and squish him like this, unfortunately, it means that pneumatic duct gets a lot shorter. So in that case, they're just more prone to extra air being pushed in there. And certainly if the, the duct itself is a little bit, you know, easy for air to squeeze into, um, can make uh, positive buoyancy disorders that much more common just from a structural standpoint. So how do you help a fish with a buoyancy issue? The first thing you're gonna do is check your water chemistry. Again, this is probably gonna solve about 50 to 75% of most buoyancy problems. Um, please use a liquid-based test kit that has been opened within the last year. The expiration date on the side is only if you have not opened it. And hopefully all your parameters test within these limits here. So step number two is to evaluate their diet. Has it been open for more than six months? Again, if you've watched any of our nutrition information, when you're consistently opening a can of food, be it for you, be it for your pets or your fish, every time you open it up, you're gonna lose some of those water soluble vitamins just to evaporation. And the most important water soluble vitamin is vitamin C. And in a lot of fish foods, they're not gonna use the expensive stuff that you know sticks around a little bit longer like they put in a lot of human foods. So after about six months, there's really not a lot of vitamin C left. So it's just better to keep your fish on a fresher diet. If they are on a flake, it has a higher surface to mass ratio. So essentially you're losing vitamins to evaporation faster. So if your fish is big enough to be on a pellet, please put them on a pellet. It just retains their nutrition better. They're not gonna like it at first, but it's gonna be some tough love so they can get better nutrition. They make really tiny pellets these days. So even if your fish is small, I bet there's a pellet out there that will work for them. And with negatively buoyant fish, you want to give them a floating pellet so they can get to the surface. Again, suck in a little bit of extra air that can go into their swim bladder. If your tank is very deep, you might need to help your fish to the surface for the first couple of times, just until they get enough energy to kind of get up to the surface. If you're able, you can drop the water level. So they, again, they don't have to work as hard. A negatively buoyant fish swimming all the way to the surface burns an enormous amount of calories. So a lot of the times with fish that are fighting buoyancy disorders, they actually get a diet increase when, when we're seeing them to evaluate them. 
Positive buoyancy, especially with those voracious surface eaters, switch to a sinking pellet so they can't gulp in any air at the surface. Yes, simple changes like this can make a big impact on your fish's overall health and diet and buoyancy. So step number three is to evaluate the environment overall. Is there too much competition during meals? Do fish really feel they have to get get in there and suck it down quickly or there's just not gonna be enough food. Is there a large discrepancy in the size of fish in the tank? So those big breeding females, they're gonna push everyone out of the way to make sure that they get their fair shoyer. If you have lots of smaller fish, they're gonna be stressed out, probably not get enough to eat and be more prone to sitting to the bottom because they just don't have the energy to get to the top. And is there enough room to grow and thrive? So we recommend at least 20 gallons per goldfish to start. Once they are big enough, they're gonna need closer to 100 gallons each. We have our lovely fish here pictured. This is Silverado. He is a 14 inch comet goldfish that has a 100 gallon tank all to himself. And believe me, he uses it all. He can't have friends. He's one of those fish that just likes being an only child. But keep in mind, these goldfish can get very, very large. Fancy goldfish, not so much. They're not going to need as much room. And with their little stunted bodies, they shouldn't be swimming as much as the comets. It just burns too many calories for them. If your fish is in a bowl, you have other problems. So get that fish out of a bowl. We have lots of other resources you can look at for that. So if you've done all this, you've looked at the water chemistry, water chemistry is fine, you've made changes to the diet, you've evaluated their environment. If you haven't seen any changes in a week, please call your veterinarian because there's probably more that you just, we, we're gonna need more help with. So either there's fluid in the swim bladder, there's structural issues, and that's gonna require radiographs or x-rays. And that's really the best way for us to diagnose is, is this a transient thing? Is there a spinal issue involved? Does your fish even have enough air to live like a normal fish? If your fish stops eating, call your veterinarian. That, that's a serious sign that something is very, very wrong. If multiple fish are having issues, call your vet. That's, that's a big deal if multiple fish are having buoyancy issues. If they're all sitting on the bottom, don't wanna eat, there's, there's something bigger at play. So if you're not located in California and Nevada, you can visit the American Association of Fish Veterinarians. If you're outside the US, we have the World Aquatic Veterinary Medical Association. So hopefully you can find someone in your area who can help you with your fish. Again, if you check the water chemistry, make sure the diet's appropriate, environment look, checks out okay, and the fish is still sick, you're gonna need more help than that. But if your fish is fixed with those first three changes, awesome. He's good to go. Just keep an eye on him. And if it comes back again, try those tricks again. So with that, I'm going to open our little chat box here and see if anybody has any specific questions. So if you gotta go, I understand. Thank you so much for joining us. Like I said, this and all of our future webinars will be up on our YouTube channel. I believe the next one is going to be Koi Reproductive Disorders. I believe we have penciled in on August 20th. So thank you again. I hope you've all learned something and enjoy your little goldfish that much more. But if anybody has any questions, feel free to put them in the chat. We'll give you a couple minutes to get those in there and then we'll be closing out. So while we're hanging out, I can just explain this picture here. Um, so this was one of those few occasions that we actually had two fish with two different buoyancy disorders. Um, the Aranda on the left, the black one, he actually was a positively buoyant. You can see he's actually got an air ulceration on his belly there. Fish that are stuck at the surface um, that with positive buoyancy can definitely get those air ulcerations where their body's just exposed to the air, it's not wet, and it ulcerates. The Aranda on the right is also a negatively buoyant fish. Um, so we had actually taken some air out of that other guy. We don't do it at all situations. It really depends on where the air is coming from. Um, 
but these are two fish um, ended up having both structural issues that they were born with from what we found from radiographs. Um, Oranda actually had a fractured spine, which is just par for the course for a lot of these guys. Um, some, they have these wonky little spines and it doesn't seem to affect them at all and others just can't deal with it. All right, so first question, does extreme heat affect the ability to rise, oops, rolled up too fast. Um, does it affect the rise and fall in the water? Um, so certainly, basically this is just the principles of air expansion in a sealed container. Yes, absolutely. We see this actually more in seahorses than we do in other fishes, but depending on the temperature, a volume of air trapped inside a fish can expand or contract depending on what the temperature of the fish and pretty much the water is. So yeah, certainly wide variations in your temperature can definitely cause these. Um, slighter variations, those um, the remirable is able to work with the temperature to get air out to where you know the tension is about where it needs to be. But yes, if, if your temperature is bouncing all around, um, there's, there's other things I would be concerned about. Um, please try to keep your temperature consistent for your little fish. All right, second question is, um, has a KH that is a little low. So the this I'm assuming is yes, it's the API kit. So the API kits for KH measure in what's known as DKH, which is a fancy German conversion is basically multiplying it by 17.1 is how you can get the milligrams per liter. Um, if the pH is stable at that level, it really depends on how many fish you have in the system, how metabolically active they are. You say your pH is about 7.6 to 7.8. I'd say that's pretty, pretty consistent. Um, a KH of 50, which I believe is about two and a half to three drops, is bare minimum. And if you're at four, you're at least able to kind of keep that consistent. I would definitely check your source water though to make sure that that is high enough coming in. And sometimes you might just need to supplement it with some of the over-the-counter uh, buffer treatments. All right. We have a kind of fancy goldfish that has not grown in the last six months and he's starting to float to the top. Um, he's in a tank with two very large goldfish and another his size. Wow, that is a lot of different information there. Um, certainly I would check your water chemistry and I definitely look at the diet with these guys. So if you have two giant fish that are eat <laughs> food, um, I'd be a little worried that those little ones aren't getting enough to eat. So um, with those situations, sometimes we recommend combining a floating and a sinking pellet, just so there's enough for kind of everyone to get their fair share. Um, certainly sometimes fish that just don't get enough to eat, just getting pushed around um, can show, can be negatively or positively buoyant. Most commonly we see negative buoyancy, but it, it is possible to, that they're just gonna overflate their swim bladder intentionally so they just don't have to work as hard. Um, I have another question about a fish that's already been seen by a veterinarian and isn't doing well. Um, you need to contact your veterinarian for follow-up care. Um, unfortunately, I can't comment on any specific fish issues with this platform. Um, we'll finish with this last question. Any problem for those negatively buoyant fish if they stay on the bottom for a long time? Yes, so certainly, I'd rather have a fish be negatively buoyant and stuck on the bottom than positively buoyant and stuck on the top. And here's why. A fish that is stuck at the surface is gonna be prone to air ulcerations all the time. And they're also stressed out that they think they're gonna be eaten at any moment. Unfortunately, they're prey animals. So they, they just think everything's out to eat them, especially the veterinarian coming along with the net. A fish that's on the bottom, and we've had a handful of negatively buoyant fish that we just can't make positively buoyant. It's just We've tried everything and it's not gonna happen. Um, the biggest problem with that is any sort of contact abrasions from the substrate. So usually with that, we recommend that they get rid of the substrate entirely and either have a bare bottom or have, they can use those little clear glass stones that they make for decorative purposes. Those are really the best and easiest ones to keep clean so those bacteria stay off your fish's belly that's on the bottom. Uh, usually they'll have little pieces of decor. The fish can kind of prop themselves upright a little bit. Um, 
but yes, usually we recommend that they get rid of the substrate just so we don't have any risk of secondary infections from a fish being just stuck on all that goo on the bottom. So thank you again, everybody. Great questions. Um, thank you so much for joining us and we'll hope you see, we'll see you next month. Have a great evening.